I'd really like to just extend my gratitude for the, the chance to speak here, um, particularly uh, after that excellent talk by Rachel. It's clear that this is bringing together uh, a really great community of um, folk who all believe in the transformative potential of technology for health. Uh, and it's a privilege to represent all my colleagues at DeepMind and, and tell you all a little bit about what our team's been up to. Um, so for those who don't know, DeepMind is an artificial intelligence company that uh, was founded in 2010 in London uh, and acquired by Google in 2014. Um, principally, we are a team of scientists who work at the cutting edge of artificial intelligence research. And we have a mission uh, that in the application of these advances, we seek to do so for societal benefit. Uh, and of course, what better domain to do this in than, than healthcare? Um, I joined DeepMind myself about two years ago from a busy practice as an academic physician, where my lab was mostly trying to use all the routine data that surround us every day in our practice to see whether we could improve patients' outcomes. Uh, and it's been remarkable to see the progress in deep learning and artificial intelligence, even in this short space of time. Um, at DeepMind itself, when I joined, there were about 200 of us or so in, in London. Uh, and, you know, symptomatic of the way this field is exploding, we are now more than four times that size with international offices in five, five different locations. DeepMind itself became famous for the development of agents that combine deep learning with reinforcement learning. Uh, I'm sure this video was shown yesterday, um, but t training agents to uh, take actions in a complex environment without explicitly instructing them on how to do so can lead to really remarkable things in specific tasks. So in this game of Pong, for example, you can see that the agent learned pretty quickly how to uh, play the game reasonably competently. But what's most exciting is what happens when you leave these algorithms to discover new strategies. Uh, in this case, this quite interesting approach of tunneling up the sides to score very efficiently on the high value red bar. Um, it's really exciting to think what the parallels of this might be in, in healthcare. Fast forward just a year and uh, scientists at DeepMind had applied similar types of algorithms to even more complicated domains, again showing how quickly progress in this field is happening. It was originally thought that um, to achieve success in something as complex as this ancient Chinese strategy game of Go might take a decade or more. But actually it turns out that although game is a, Go is a game of uh, very simple rules, the complexity in the game itself is massive. There, there are more possible board positions in a typical game than there are atoms in the, in the known universe. And yet, with deep and reinforcement learning strategies, not only was it possible to, to master this game, but actually even more excitingly, it was possible to develop a system uh, known as AlphaGo Zero that was able to achieve superhuman proficiency in this game with, uh, without any human input at all. Uh, this means that this system can in some ways exceed the constraints of predefined human knowledge. And there are some really interesting um, videos and texts being written about how new strategies were uncovered by this AI system in playing the game in the matter of days that have taken us as, as human culture thousands of years to discover and learn. And these are now in turn feeding back to the Go community, um, really exciting, highly efficient ways of, of playing the game. So it's clear that there's remarkable progress in the actual underlying research that's propelling artificial intelligence in the world. But I think we're also at a really interesting inflection point where these kind of algorithms are having kind of concrete, positive applications in the real world. Uh, ourselves at DeepMind, we've had great success applying some of these techniques to Google's data centers. Again, this is an application that has real positive societal impact. If you think about the energy use in one of these data centers, it's really quite significant. Initially, you know, our team and others were skeptical as to whether we could improve performance in this sort of setting because these systems are created and controlled with meticulous attention to detail by brilliant engineers. And yet, by applying deep and reinforcement learning techniques, it was possible to reduce the amount of cooling used in one of these centers. Uh, reduce the energy used for cooling by up to 40%. So of course this brings us on to uh, the open question of whether artificial intelligence could have a significant impact and transform healthcare for the better. I think the first thing to say is that it's important to approach this topic with a good dose of humility and realism. 
Healthcare is clearly uh, much more complicated as an environment than a game of Go, vastly more complicated even than a, a very sophisticated data center. Healthcare systems all around the world are struggling with some of the same big public health challenges. And so it's exciting to think about how early progress in AI could really cross that Rubicon and translate to meaningful benefits in clinical outcomes, patient and staff experience, or reduce the costs of care. As I said earlier, I think you know, this conference alone has shown how much early progress is being made in this field. From everything uh, from the RSNA challenge that Rachel outlined earlier, all the way out to you know, great and exciting companies across the globe making progress in a variety of different domains in healthcare. Our own work in this field uh, started about two years ago in a really exciting research collaboration with experts at Moorfields Hospital, which is um, one of the, the best eye hospitals in the world. There we were able to work in really close partnership with some brilliant clinicians uh, to address this pressing societal problem of preventable sight loss. This is an issue that sort of affects about 300 million people around the world. And what's exciting about this is that although sight loss is a, a cause of tremendous personal as well as socioeconomic burden, actually about 80 or 90% of it may well be preventable if it's caught early enough. At the same time, the imaging techniques that are used to study the back of the eye are evolving rapidly and democratizing. So this really complicated image you see on the screen is now the gold standard of how you image the back of the eye. It's called an OCT scan or an optical coherence tomography scan. And yet interpreting an image like this is really quite complicated. The challenge of course is if these images can be captured on the community and the high street or increasingly hopefully anywhere in the world, even in developing countries, how do you rapidly assess these kind of images and find out whether a patient or a member of the public is one of the very few who does have an urgent problem? And how do you then prioritize these people who have these urgent problems so they can get to an expert as quickly as possible? So last month, we were really excited to see some of this research published in the journal Nature Medicine. Um, the results showed that we were able to train an AI system working together with these experts at Moorfields that could detect over 50 different types of pathology in these images and prioritize them by level of clinical urgency. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the plot you see here, this is called a receiver operator characteristic curve. Essentially, the closer you get to the top left of this plot, the better the diagnostic performance. So uh, any kind of dot that you would see in the top left means that a system is able to recognize all of the urgent cases and not miss uh, any disease. The dots you can see numbered from one to eight there are experts we worked with at Moorfields. And the summary point performance of our algorithm is reflected by this star here. And it, this was an incredibly exciting result for our team. You know, we, we, we saw here that our algorithm was able to allocate the most urgent cases correctly in a test set of just over a thousand cases with the same level of accuracy as experts at Moorfields who in the case of number one and two had more than 20 years of clinical experience at Europe's largest eye hospital. The other thing is that in medicine, of course, not all errors are the same. Uh, we were really encouraged to see our system was able to not misclassify a single urgent case. And again, this kind of thing can be really important when people's sight is at stake. At DeepMind, we're very much of the opinion that artificial intelligence won't replace doctors, but rather it will hopefully make their lives better. There's a real potential here for AI to be a useful tool for clinicians that benefits patients. But if this is going to be the case in the real world, AI systems that make recommendations to doctors are also hopefully going to be able to explain or in some way be interacted with, such that doctors can scrutinize this decision, even if not mathematically in the inner workings of the network, then at least understanding some aspect of how the decision is released is, is likely to be helpful. Our own work split this neural network into two different stages. The first stage creates a color tissue map, like you see here, that outlines not only the normal areas of anatomy in the eye, but also delineates where the network thinks there is disease. So as you can see here, the network is quite certain about this area of blue fluid in the eye.
but then this kind of flickering red area is indicating uh, that the network does also think there's some dangerous blood vessels growing into the back of the eye. And the flickering is an indication of the uncertainty with which the network thinks this is the case. And we found in working with more fields that this could be a really exciting aspect of the algorithm because it means a doctor can actually reach their own conclusion about what's going on in the image and then see whether or not the representation of the tissues by the network agrees with that or otherwise. This sort of thing also could potentially be of value for medical education. Here you can see a real example where there's fluid in the upper layer of the eye here. And one of the uh, doctors we worked with at Moorfields had drawn round areas of fluid in the image. And you can see that in this very early example of the network in training, it was able to identify some fluid here that was missed in this particular example. And it's really interesting to see what happens when you play that finding back to an expert, um, and particularly whether or not that may have really positive applications in training to learn how to interpret these images. It's also true to say that these kind of approaches could have implications for how we treat as well as how we diagnose patients. So for the millions around the world suffering with cancer, a little known but important part of therapy often involves targeting radiation to treat the tumor. And a key part of that process is drawing around all of the organs painstakingly and meticulously in the scan so that the radiotherapy itself can be targeted. To be blunt about this, is not really a task that most physicians enjoy doing. In a typical head and neck case like this, it can take somewhere between four and eight hours to, with millimeter-specific precision, draw around all of the organs in the head and neck that are relevant to the treatment of the tumor. We were really excited to see that a, a very similar type of deep learning system, modifications to the UNET that we used for that first stage of, of our ophthalmology work, was able to reach the performance level of expert humans at our um, partners for this wor work in London, at University College London. And as you can see in the scrolling image here, even when it comes to really important um, structures, like the optic nerve, as in this case, you know, an, an error here is, is unconscionable for a patient because if the radiation beam is mistargeted, that could result in blindness. And yet we were encouraged to see that our system was able to very, very accurately segment the anatomy in these examples. As Rachel alluded to earlier, there's also a concern when it comes to how much data is required in applications in medicine. I think for you know, typical image classification tasks, it's going to be acceptable to have deep learning networks that rely on many thousands of images to train. But for medicine, of course, medical images are expensive, and if devices or clinical practice change, it can then take time to accumulate new training data. So another thing that we're really excited about this sort of work is that in this particular collaboration, for example, the training data set was just 650 uh, different scans, and we think that could also be very important. We're really encouraged by some of this early progress, and so we're now scaling our own work to many different areas where we think there's significant public health need. We're excited to be working with Cancer Research UK, but also with experts in Japan at the JK University on the challenge of identifying breast cancer in screening mammograms. This is, again, obviously a, a hugely common condition that accounts for a large disease burden, but the delivery of public health uh, systems for screening in mammography is really challenging. In the UK alone, two experts are required to read each one of these images, and yet every lady between the ages of 50 and 70 is invited for a screening exam every three years. And this, again, poses an obvious example of where it's possible that deep learning might be able to assist the specialists who are doing this amazing work. Again, there's going to be lots of detail in how this work is done in ways that are clinically safe and that translate with peer-reviewed evidence to show genuine benefit for patients. There are many examples outside of healthcare of where artificial intelligence systems have essentially reprised the patterns and the proportions of patterns that are found in their training data. And whereas this has already had you know, very unacceptable consequences in various non-medical settings, the question of that happening in medicine also therefore needs careful attention. And that's one of the reasons why we're so excited to be working with international partners and international experts in many of our areas of application, as with the example of Japanese collaborators in our mammography work. As Rachel alluded to earlier, it's, there are also many applications of deep learning beyond uh, just medical imaging. For example, there are many aspects of medicine in which 
What we're trying to do to better treat patients is to predict forwards what's going to happen, to use the sequential data that surround us every day in our practice to predict things about our patients and take preventative action. It's the very early stage of some of this work with the Veterans Affairs, but we are essentially collaborating with experts in their own data science team to work on very thoroughly anonymized health records to try and identify whether we can predict important signs of patient deterioration before they happen. And we'll be really excited to come back and share more of this research as it progresses into next year. I think the thing that's going to take most attention in the next few years is going to be how much of this very exciting research actually crosses over into practice. And there's going to be lots of different aspects that this is going to require. In healthcare, I think the first thing is that it's very much an evidence-driven and safety-first industry, and that's quite right. Patient safety has to be at the heart of every innovation. But it's also true that the ways in which technology is implemented in the workflow are going to be as important as the technology itself. So it's going to be far more important than just having proficient algorithms to actually have acceptable ways that those algorithms can be surfaced to the clinicians and patients who are actually using them. This is going to mean a lot of attention to user interface, user experience, great software that delivers these things right into the heart of workflows where they're needed. Health data are obviously also very different to other types of data, and attention to confidentiality, security, and privacy is going to matter a lot, but also to data quality. When training, for example, on medical data, it's, it's going to be really important for the medical community that there are acceptable, gu guaranteed standards of data quality, and ideally, maybe even open test sets, so that when we reach an era of there being multiple available algorithms to tackle a problem, it's possible for the clinical community and patients to see reproducible evidence that can fairly compare diagnostic performance in a given gold standard. Finally, I think uh, the thing that's perhaps most important of all, uh, and my closing point, is going to be that patients really have to be at the heart with the development of all this technology. We already know as a clinical community that it, this is true for pretty much every piece of research we conduct, that patients have to be at the heart. And at DeepMind, something that has really driven all of our research projects has been the presence of patients on our steering committees. Patients don't only inform the projects we choose to take on, but they remain actively involved throughout. They dictate how our experimental iteration progresses and which, which ways in which we configure and conduct our research itself. And I think this is perhaps the most important point of all, that if patients are ultimately who we hope to benefit from all of the exciting progress in artificial intelligence and healthcare, we've got to start placing them at the heart of everything we do. Thanks very much. Wow. Amazing work. Thanks to you and your colleagues for really driving a lot of this. One question. We want to think maybe five years in the future, even a decade. Where might you imagine all of this is going to be in the reality of a clinic, let's say, in London? So I think you know, an exciting eventuality would be that five years from now, deep learning isn't uh, viewed or artificial intelligence isn't viewed as a kind of exciting thing that clinicians and patients read about in, in the press um, but don't see in their practice. I think a really exciting future would be one in which it's regarded as a routine tool that's subject to the usual standards of peer-reviewed evidence that clinicians and patients feel really comfortable about having found a mature place in their treatment. And are the regulatory bodies keeping up with this? Yeah, I think, I think they are doing a great job, actually. I think if you look at both uh, in the States and in Europe, there's a lot of attention now focused on deep learning and, and in software in general in its role in in the provision of care, and I think, um, I think of course, you know, uh, that's going to require an update to regulations that were originally designed not for deep learning, but I think the regulators are doing a great job of this already. Right. All right, and thanks for coming from the UK. Cheers. Thanks.